Okay, we'll call this meeting to order. Um, first business, election of chairperson, vice chair, and secretary. And remind me of this current site besides the chair. What's the, I'm forgetting right now. <laughs> Who's, Mark, are you the vice chair right now? I, I believe so. Yeah. <laughs> um, who's the second? Oh, is and it Carol? Are you Carol secretary? Is the secretary? Yeah. Okay. So do we hear any uh, nominations? I nominate the current slate. Okay. <laughs> Can we do that? Sure. Is there a second? Yeah, I'll second it, Jason. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Passes. Hey, hey, John, I mean, yep. I'm assuming we have a quorum. I, I don't see, um, we have oh, we, we're missing Dennis. Oh, there's Dennis, I'm yeah. sorry. Thank you, I think we're good. Yeah. yeah, we still have one opening, don't we, on this? Yes. Yeah, we've been advertising for a while for, yes. maybe we gotta do some active recruiting to get somebody on this. Okay, uh, we have the finance director here to give an update. I'm sorry. Hello, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, I have. I believe that Lori had sent you all emailed out the December report today. And I apologize, I was unable to get that September report. Um, but you can see that we have put in the town's contributions for the employer employee contributions. Um, the fees, the audit are all taken <clears throat> into account with this. And then you'll notice I have um, fund assets of 146 015 959 which is a town of Groton assets. And right below that, you'll see I have the reconciliation to SEI because we have a deposit in transit that is not reflected in their records. And we have an um, AP for, I believe it's for postage that's due from the retirement fund. It's not reflected in their records. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Next order of business, approval of the uh, November 12th, 2020 minutes. Um, if everyone's had a chance to review them, um, I'll entertain a motion when you're ready. So move, this is Mark. Okay. Do we hear a second? I'll second. Okay. A motion and a second to approve the November 12th, 2020 meeting minutes. Any discussion, any changes? If not, uh, let's go ahead and vote. I say aye if you're in favor. Aye. 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 Thank you. Authorization of payments from retirement fund for retirement benefits for a series of people. Someone moved it. And we usually move it as one packet. Whenever people are ready, we can make a motion. This is Mark. I'll move them. You have a second? I'll second, Jason. Jason, got it. Okay, we have a motion and a second to authorize the uh, series of payments. Um, any discussion? If not, we'll go ahead and vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Okay, SEI Investments. Let's hear all the good news. <laughs> okay, great. Hi, everybody. Hope you're doing well. Um, please don't blame my last name on the recent big snowstorms we've had. <laughs> I've already heard that joke about five times in the last week, so uh, it never gets old. Um, would you like me to share my presentation? Sure, let me make you a, a co-host one sec here. Looks like I might already be a co-host. You were set now anyway, so. Okay. <laughs> All right, so let's. Oh, okay. That's nice. <laughs> okay, can everyone see that okay? Yeah. Yes, perfect. Okay, great. So we do have the executive summary. Um, you can use that for some of the minutes you're going to put together after the meeting. Um, you know, as you stated, we've, we've had quite a run here. We started out with some volatility around election time. 
and um, some uncertainty around COVID, obviously, at that point in time. But then some good news came out, a couple of solid vaccine candidates, which are in production now, and actually a third and fourth are out there now as well. So there is some light at the end of the tunnel. Um, the market has reacted very favorably to the vaccines. And um, it also has been pricing in a pretty significant stimulus package. So, you know, if either of those go the, the wrong way or if the vaccine takes longer to get to the public um, or if the stimulus plan just keeps getting pushed back and back and we have um, some issues there, we could see more volatility pop in. So we're, we're close to record highs at all the major indices today. If you take a look at the right-hand side of this chart, there was a little bit of a difference this time around. We started to see a rotation and I'll talk more about that in a minute. You can see looking at it on a one-year basis, very strong returns for US and small cap stocks. Um, very, they're very close um, in nature. Um, developed international emerging markets, so still very strong absolute returns, but did underperform US equities. And we had very strong returns in fixed income. So we've been in a low interest rate environment, but yields even trended lower during that period of time. When you look, the longer you were with the duration, the longer your maturities were within your bonds, um, the better you did last year. Investment grade bonds had about 10% return. And then even asset classes like Calio bonds, emerging market debt, which are great diversifiers for the portfolio over the long run, um, did have some pretty solid returns on the fixed income side of the equation. Commodities, commodities finally had a really good quarter. It's been quite some time since we saw a positive quarter in the commodities arena. If you remember going back earlier last year, we had oil and negative prices, and now we're around $56 a barrel. So significant um, ramp up in oil prices. We're starting to see that at the gas tank today, as many of you know. Um, but that really, oil was the biggest leader in commodities. And there's some other um, commodities that did well, gold, silver, um, and others as well. But that, that bucket did very well in the fourth quarter. So I believe I showed you this chart back at our, one of our last two meetings. If you looked at this chart back in September, um, it was kind of interesting because we talked about the big five names, um, the FANG stocks throwing Microsoft. We talked about how well they did throughout last year. When you look at this and you take out those five stocks from the S&P 500, we're now seeing a positive 10.8% return with that. Now, when we go back to the chart, we showed a little bit, um, towards the latter half of last year, when I showed you this chart, it was actually a negative 2% return. So when I talked about a rotation, we're starting to see that. We saw that towards the end of the fourth quarter, we started to see money move into value-oriented organizations and companies, um, some financials, some, some sectors that have really lagged the entire year last year. And frankly, some of them even had negative returns through most of last year. So we finally started to see that. I just thought it was interesting to update this chart because you can see we finally have a positive return without those five big names. And we can see that again on page seven. So we talked about a rotation. Is this short term in nature? It could be. Um, is this a longer term trend we're seeing in the market? We've been waiting for value to outpace growth for quite some time in our actively managed strategies. Um, the good news is you participated fully in the growth strategies because you're indexed um, in the U.S. large cap space. Um, but going forward, it's something to consider. And I could talk to Ken about this as well. I mean, the value trade has lost for so long. Is it time to maybe take a look at the value trade going forward? Given that we have these vaccines out there, we could see a return uh, to normalcy of our everyday activities, you know, six, eight months from now. Uh, we could start to see some of these companies that have been left behind really start to pick up um, and add value to portfolios as a whole. So we saw that if you look at the fourth quarter, um, you could see it actually outpaced growth. And that's the first time we've seen uh, value outpace growth in a number of years. From a sector standpoint, I mean, technology still led the way, obviously, because of those big five name stocks. Um, that was the big winner for the year and then consumer discretionary communications. Uh, the big loser, as I spoke a little bit about earlier, was energy on a one-year basis. Any questions around the equity markets? 
So international equity as well. We do have a sleeve in the portfolio to international equity. I think that's a great thing from a diversification standpoint. We are underweight international equity relative to US. So when you look at it from a capital market standpoint, um, we actually have an underweight to international. Now, with that being said, that was a very positive trend we had in the portfolio because US has done so, so well that entire time we had that overweight. But again, international equities look very attractive relative to US equities. So another thing we're probably gonna to start to talk about is maybe we should have a little bit more within the international equity arena going forward. Um, right now, I think you're in a safe place, but it's, it is something we should probably discuss because the US has led the way for quite some time, but there's a lot of value out there within international and emerging market equity arenas. So from a valuation standpoint, both international and emerging markets look very attractive. And fixed income, a lot has happened. Um, used to be really boring to talk about fixed income because rates were just range bound for about six years. Um, we saw pretty dramatic moves in the yield curve here. So you can see on page nine, bottom left-hand chart, 1231.19, where the yield curve was. We had that slight inversion we talked about several times. And now you can see where we're at today. So looking at 1231.2020, you can see the yield curve has steepened. And what does that mean? It means the lower end of the yield curve, um, you can see is pretty much pegged towards zero. And the longer end of the yield curve went up. So we saw a steepening yield curve. And um, we have recently seen rates rise. So I think as of today, the tenure was at 1.12%. And it's been a while since we've been over 1%. It was earlier last year where we hit over 1% at one point in time. So we've been consistently above 1% for the past several weeks. Um, so we have seen a trend higher. Again, we don't expect <laughs> a very fast tick up in interest rates, um, range bound, but it could have a higher bias going forward especially if we start to see economic recovery after the pandemic. Any questions around fixed income? Okay. All right, so let's get into some of the positive news here. We'll focus in on your fiscal year date return. You had about a 15.7% return thus far. Um, we still have about four months to go here in your fiscal year. Um, but a very solid number there, almost 16% on a fiscal year to date basis. So it's interesting when we go back and you look at your mid-March returns, you were down about 25% at one point in time in, in, in the, that mid-March range. So we've erased that whole thing and we have a 16% return. So pretty significant upswings in the market um, just by looking at these numbers. From a long-term perspective, um, something we all like to see, um, Ken and myself, you know, outpacing that actuarial assumption rate. And we've been able to do that consistently for a long, long period of time in this portfolio, going all the way back to 2002. Now, we've talked about also capital market assumptions across the industry have been coming down. So we expect fixed income not to have as high, as high returns, obviously with the low interest rate environment we're in and the, and the the aspect of maybe interest rates going higher, we can see negative returns of fixed income. <clears throat> and then equities have had such a long bull market run since the credit crisis, um, we're expecting muted equity returns going forward as well. So this portfolio, looking at it at face, if I looked at this and I looked at a 10 year basis on a short term basis, you would probably be around a five and a five per, uh, percent return for the next five to 10 years based on that, based on this portfolio. Now, when you look at it from a long-term perspective, when you go out 40, 50 years, we're still well above that actuarial assumption rate with our expectations of this portfolio. So it's a little bit of a balance, right? So while there is expected short-term rates of returns of lower than maybe 6%, do you wanna take on a lot of equity risk right now when we're at all-time highs across equity markets? So these are things we just have to kind of think about and have conversations about as we took a, take a look at the asset allocation just because your short-term returns are lower than your actual assumption rate doesn't necessarily mean that you have to put, you know, 20% in emerging market equities in order to, in order to get that return over that 7% or seven and a quarter percent um, threshold. So again, just conversations that I've been having with clients uh, while we expect, expect muted returns for the next five to 10 years, 
it doesn't mean we're not going to have a strong year like we did last year. Uh, from a return perspective, uh, the index is all performed in line. So we're indexed on a large cap side, um, a small cap side. And then um, also we have the uh, international uh, index as well. So pretty much indexed across the entire um, equity space. So we're in line with all the indexes, respective indexes. On the fixed income side of the equation, um, we did pretty well. Um, core fixed income on your fiscal year to date return, still 2.5% return. So we know yields around one, um, not too bad for a fiscal year to date standpoint. When you look at it from a one year standpoint, that's a pretty significant return for investment grade bonds and core fixed income, 9.6%. <clears throat> High yield bonds have added value specifically within your fiscal year. So we have a 14.7% return there. And then also real estate um, had, a, had really good returns for your fiscal year, 12.5% return. When you look at it on a one year basis, we saw REITs get hit pretty hard during the pandemic early on. So we had some pretty significant um, negative returns. The good news is the way the portfolio was positioned, we outperformed the index significantly on a one year basis within the, the, the REIT, uh, real estate fund strategy. Pat, this is Ken. Any any update through uh, this this year, this calendar year, first month and a half or so? I have the market value as of yesterday. Okay. So we did gain. So we're at one hundred and fifty million thirty six thousand six sixty five one five zero zero three six 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 five. Thank you. For the month of January, we saw um, slightly negative returns on the equity side of the, the equation. Uh, we continue to see small cap outpace large caps. We have positive returns in the small cap space, negative returns in the large cap space. And fixed income is relatively muted with maybe flat to slightly negative returns because the yields rose uh, within the month of January. But overall, the portfolio remained relatively flat through the month of January and gained over the last um, week. Any other questions around the performance? Any questions about the market in general or my crystal ball for the year or anything? <laughs> <laughs> That's what we want to know. <laughs> I really think um, with these vaccines coming in and if we get the distribution channels set up properly and get the uh, vaccinations moving out quicker to the to the public and eventually to to us, um, I, I believe we could see a pretty significant um, recovery within the economic numbers. And I think that could lead to a continued rally. Like I said, there's been some stocks that have really rallied through this entire period. There's a lot of stocks that have not. I believe those stocks that have not rallied, mainly in the value arena and some others, some cyclical stocks, um, I believe those stocks can do very well and um, they can hold up the portfolios. Hey, hey Pat, this, this is Mark and I, this may not be the right time to ask this, but I'll, I'll put it out there. And there is no, it's really just discussion. I mean, before the pandemic hit, you know, there had just been ongoing discussion that, that this rally that's been going on for eight, 10 years, it's got to come to an end at some point. Then the pandemic came and we kind of, you know, there was a downturn definitely, but it probably had very little to do with, with normal economic conditions or normal market conditions. It had everything to do with the pandemic. And more and more, I hear that, you know, it, once once the vaccines are out there and the economy will bounce back and we're going to kind of continue the, the rally um, or potentially continue the rally. And it just I just find it curious that for all the discussion pre pandemic that, you know, th 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 this has got to come to these things don't last forever. And, and you know, it was a pretty sustained rally for 10, 12 years in one form or another. But now there doesn't appear, there doesn't appear to be much discussion of that at all anywhere, which I just find odd. Um, 
is it wishful thinking or is it um, is the downturn that took place as a result of the pandemic did that address all the issues that normally a downturn would would deal with in terms of adjusting values and so forth? Unfair I question. I, it's an unfair question, and and certainly, um, uh, well, I, whatever comments you have would be appreciated. Okay. No, I, I think it's a very fair question. Um, I don't necessarily think it's wishful thinking. I mean, let's take a look at it from this standpoint. So. The pandemic was a disaster, right? I consider it a global disaster. So yep. if you go back to any major disaster that happened, tsunamis in Japan, earthquakes in Turkey, I mean, just going all the way back through history, if you look what happens after the disaster, the market just sells off significantly for a six to eight month period, right? But then you have a resurgence of the economy, right? So we've had all, everyone's been sitting at home getting cabin fever, saving money. Most people have been saving money. They're not traveling as much. They're just buying groceries and things like that. Um, there's a lot of money out there that once the economy starts to open up, once these movie theaters start to open up, these restaurants, people are going to go out and they're going to spend. I mean, that's human nature, right? We like to be with other people. So I really think there's going to be a resurgence of the, econ um, the economy after things open up again. But you're right, we've been in a long bull market, the longest in history, um, with the exception of what happened last year for a two and a half month period with the downturn. We had that recessionary period. Uh, we had that correction in the market. And we're gonna see those going forward, but that doesn't necessarily mean the bull market's over. Hey, Mark. Hey, Mark. Hey, yes. Mark. Yeah. Hi, Dennis O'Brien. Um, the other thing too is that the Federal Reserve is keeping the rates down around zero. Uh, because we still have 20 million people unemployed. And as long as they leave, leave the bank rates close to zero, uh, people are keeping money in the bank, but they're, they're realizing between inflation and taxes, they've got to invest. So a lot of them are late to the party and we're seeing probably a bit of a bubble, but it, it could last depending on Fed policy another couple of years. Maybe, who knows, nobody really knows. What do you guys think? Uh, I, I agree with that. And I think I was actually going to bring that point up. So I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, I do agree with prices are very high in the market, right? But it's the valuations are only high in certain areas within the equity markets. And we talked about that, right? So there's all these stocks that have been left behind that have been impacted mainly by COVID um, and have been many you know, restaurants, um, you know, the travel industry, I mean, you name it, leisure has all been impacted significantly and had negative returns all through last year. Those types of areas, once the economy starts to open up, are going to hold the economy up. Uh, people are going to spend in those areas. So I think we could see a run up um, after that. Um, but again, then people are going to focus back on valuations and say, wait a minute, where are we from a fundamental standpoint? Because right now, fundamentals haven't mattered, right? It doesn't matter. I mean, you have these stocks with PE ratios of 500 and 700 which are getting 500% returns. So, I mean, fundamentals are out the door all last year and still are somewhat to today, but eventually the market's gonna get back to fundamentals and you know, we could see a sell off. I mean, it's normal to have these corrections within market cycles. Pat, I have a question. I know my grandchildren were talking about it and it was, I don't have all the details correct, but it was something about like a games, GameStop site or, or they were every, all the young generation was buying up this stock and, and I guess hedge fund managers were going crazy. Could you explain what that was about? Is that anything affected on, on ours? Ken, do you want to take a stab at this one? I've been talking for a while. <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> Uh, Carol, before I before I get to that, and I and I will touch that, I just wanted to kind of you know echo um, a lot of what was said on on where the markets are. Again, the, these markets are not all equal. So what we saw, uh, you know, with growth stocks, mostly technology stocks, in the pandemic, um, really surged because they actually took advantage of opportunities that the pandemic created for them. Whereas retail, you know, leisure stocks really got hit hard. And then you'll see, as we've saw in the fourth quarter, continuing into the first quarter this year, uh, a, a cycling of that. Um, and, and all of a sudden, you know, with the thought that the economy can improve, now all of a sudden these stocks that had gotten hammered 
you know, um, are, are, are looking much better. So, uh, again, not everything's being equal. And as Dennis said, you know, with interest rates basically being zero and you, you've got to try to get return <clears throat> somewhere. Now, all of a sudden, you know, an equity with, with perhaps with a yield associated with it, you know, looks that much better. So um, we've got a slide and in, in when I get, you know, my deck um, on board here that really talks about, uh, kind of the net worth of, of households and how that's grown. And at the same time, um, the, the amount that they need to pay off debt has reduced as, as interest rates have come down. So, you know, as, as uh, Pat suggested, if in fact, the pan, if, if the pandemic eases, you know, the vaccine takes hold, there's going to be this pent up demand, you know, to go out there, which could continue, you know, certainly into 2021, you know, this. Um, that said, you know, any negative news, you know, I think the market's already priced in a lot of the good news. So any negative news could, could be met with, um, you know, with something, you know, le less assuring to that. So um, more, more to follow and I'll, I'll get a little bit into more detail when, when I get my deck up there. Um, Carol, to, to, to your question, basically, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit of the, the environment that we're in, you know, where social media, you know, can take over and, uh, all of a sudden, you, you get groupings of individuals through social media that end up buying a stock that fundamentally isn't worth the growth that they have, but all of a sudden they package all of their, their efforts together um, and they go after this stock to raise, raise the bar on it. And at the same time, hedge funds, which had shorted the stock, meaning that they were betting that the stock price would fall, now all of a sudden they had to cover the, the growth in there. Um, it, again, it's, I, I don't believe it's something that fundamentally can, can be sustained over a, a, you know, a very long period of time. I think as Pat suggested, everything has to come back to the company's fundamentals, to the price of that stock. But in a short period of time with momentum building, all of a sudden, you, know, you, you can either make or lose a lot of money that has nothing to do with the actual value of, of that stock itself. And I think that's, that's basically what, what has happened. How, how that gets continued, I think, from a regulatory standpoint, will be an interesting, um, you know, situation. You know, whether the government feels that they need to come in and, you know, and regulate that in some mm. form or fashion. But I think it, it's it's kind of a little bit of, you know, where we are in society that all of a sudden, you know, groupings of people can come together in a way that they never could before. So it could just be a flash in the pan. I, I think it's it's one of those flash in the pans that no no pun intended, but I think they figured out how to game the system <laughs> and, uh. and basically you know come at it in a way that um, you, you know goes after you know the hedge funds which had shorted these stocks you know by by actually getting a lot of people to invest in it to raise the price again in in, a, in an environment where fundamentally it didn't make any sense. So I think eventually again. The stock has to come yeah. back to its fundamental price. Big news, though, didn't it? So I'm going to tell my grandson not to invest in it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a pyramid scheme. Yeah. You know, the, again, we, we saw a lot of this with the tech bubble back, you know, in, in a different way. But, you know, all of a sudden, you know, back in the late 90s, um, you know, where, you know, again, the stock prices just were growing, growing, growing. You can't fundamentally support it, but people got afraid that they were going to miss out on something. They jumped in and eventually, you know, the bubble burst. And, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Pat, Pat, this is Jason. I just had a quick question. Hi, Jason. Hi. Um, does the portfolio automatically rebalance or is there a set time a year that rebalancing happens and how does that work? I might just be because I'm new to the committee somewhat, so I haven't followed that. Uh, Jason, thanks. It's a good question. Um, the portfolio rebalances on a quarterly basis. So it is a form of dollar cost averaging, right? So, um, you know, whatever, whatever has been beaten down, we're taking money out of the, the, the areas that have done well and putting it back into those areas that have sold off. So it's kind of a form of dollar cost averaging through rebalancing. Uh, but we do that on a quarterly basis to make sure you maintain a 2% variance around your targets. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions for Pat? If not, thank you, Pat. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. 
I think we could take, uh, yeah, thank you. John, can, can, I, I, can I share my screen or do I need yep, to? Yep, let me make you co-host just a second. Okay. You should be set. Okay, everybody see that? Yep. Okay, so let me go back. Um, I, I want to echo a, a lot of what Pat, you know, had, had talked about in terms of, you know, the, the market in, in um, 2020 and, and, and carry over a little bit into what we're seeing in, in the first part of 2021. Um, that rotation to value was, was pretty significant in the fourth quarter. Uh, you know, a month and, and a few days is not, is not a market to, to, you know, to, you know, absolutely put your, your foot into, but uh, it appears that that growth has has at least you know come back to equal value um, in the first part of, of 2021. What what's interesting is the small caps you know that have really taken over, um, and that, that has had a significant return um, you know in the first part of this year. So uh, you know we'll, we'll we'll see, but it but again I think what we want to you know focus on is is again that. Uh, the anticipation of the vaccine taking hold, though a lot of those companies that really got hammered, you know, look like they're, they're, they're coming back. Um, th this chart, uh, you know, I, I really kind of like this a lot. Um, what, it, what it looks at is the uh, time frame between 1980 and in 2020, so 41 calendar years. The bar chart represents what the calendar year return was for the S&P 500 in each of those individual years. What the red dot represents is the, the low point of the S&P 500 in that given year. So uh, in, in 1980, for example, the, the, um, the low point of the S&P 500, it was down 17%, but it ended up the year positive 26%. Um, as you read, you know, kind of the, the line above, you know, it, it notes that in 31 of the 41 years, so about 75%, the S&P 500 ends up to be positive. And, and again, that's, you know, that's something of significance. However, in, in, if you average all of those red dots, the average decline in, in each of those years is about 14%. And if you fast forward all the way to the right-hand side, 20, uh, the year 2020, we ended up the year plus 16%, but we were down 34%. Uh, at one point, you know, obviously in the first quarter of the year. Uh, and that 50% spread uh, between high and low or between ending and low uh, represents the second largest spread in, in, in that 41 year period. Point here is that there is volatility in, in the markets, in, in, you know, particularly in the equity markets. Um, and the, the long-term nature of, of the investment that we're looking at, you know, for, for the plan for, is, is that you can withstand that short-term volatility as you know, 31 of the 41 years we, we end up to be positive. So I think that's you know it's worth noting, you know, as we as we look at that volatility and, and, and what can cause that, you know, at any point. So um, let me see, it's 20. We we talked um, Pat talked a little bit about the international markets, and I think this chart kind of reflects you know the difference between the returns that we've seen on, on the U.S. markets as represented by that gray line or lines. And then the purple line represent the, the international markets. And up until about 2009, uh, it looks like they were pretty much, you know, in sync or you know, pretty close to each other. And all of a sudden the U.S. markets really took off and the uh, international markets were up a little bit, but, you know, really, you know, didn't have that same momentum. If you kind of look in the box there, um, you, you can see that if we're, we're looking at the forward price to earnings ratio, generally the lower the price to earnings, the better opportunities for, you know, for, for appreciation in that. Um, significantly less for the international stocks than the, the S&P 500. And then the dividend yield, you know, represents a, 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 you know, about 171% for the international relative to the S&P 500. So what it, what it suggests is that there's opportunities in the international markets, if in fact you, you you think that there are good, you know, stocks, good companies outside domiciled outside of the U.S., so that as as Pat suggested, maybe something to take a look at 
as we you know maybe look at tweaking the asset allocation which really hasn't changed um, you know in, in at least five years so that may be something you know to, to take a, a, a quick look at um, the, the last thing I just wanted to and again any questions you'll feel free to ask as you have um, we we do you know this is what I call the quilt chart it, it basically looks at different asset classes. And again, this is not necessarily reflective of, of what the town of Bratton has for different asset classes, but it looks at a series of different asset classes and ranks them from the best performing uh, to the worst performing in, in each individual year. And, and what, what it kind of shows you is that, is that there's no predictability between what, uh, what you get in an asset class return one year versus what you get in another. But if you end up diversifying that into a, um, you know, a diversified portfolio of, the, uh, of a collection of those asset classes, that gray shaded box represents what that is. And generally you're, you're getting about a middle of, the return, middle of the road return for the portfolio by diversification. You guys know that. And that's one of the reasons why we have a diversified <clears throat> portfolio for the town of Bratton. And if you go long-term, which again is most important, um, we look at the annualized return over about a 15 year period of time, the last two columns to the right. You see again, that asset allocation box of about 6.7% return, a decent return you know, for the long-term. And the far right-hand column is the volatility of that return, which is significantly lower than what you get for most of the asset classes. So you know, decent return, lower volatility, that's sort of what, you know, what diversification is all about. And so what ultimately we wanna do is say, you know, are we comfortable continuing with the asset allocation strategy that we have? Does it, you know, should we think about, you know, tweaking it a little bit, you know, um, international? We, we talked to Dennis talked a little bit about real estate uh, at a previous meeting, you know, what, you know, is that, is that the right allocation, high yield? You know, are there different asset classes that we think may, may add some value, you know, by, by adding them all? And then obviously, and Bill will talk a lot about this, you know, for when, when, uh, when he talks about the actuarial report, what, what's the long-term assumed or expected return, you know, that we ought to be looking at. We, we, we changed over in 2018 to seven and a quarter percent, as, as uh, Pat suggested, you know, asset class returns going forward look like they're coming down. Uh, our numbers would suggest that we're we probably should be closer to a seven percent expected return, you know, than the seven and a quarter percent. So that that may be something that we want to talk about as well. And the last thing I just wanted to highlight again is looking at uh, the actual funds themselves from from a compliance standpoint. And again, this last co this column over over on the far right hand side, uh, looking at the criteria that. Uh, the investment policy statement, you know, considers when evaluating the, the actual investment themselves. Everything is in green, either passes or in the top SR quartile. So all the funds that are in the lineup are, you know, ha have a passing grade. And, uh, you know, certainly from a due diligence standpoint, look, uh, look like they're, they're doing their job. So, um, so I think, you know, again, a lot of volatility last year, um, you know, mostly on the upside in the last three quarters. This year is starting out to be very strong as well. We could see that volatility continue. Um, you, you're, you know, the lineup that you've got is working. But do, what do we want to do going forward, both in terms of the expected return for the portfolio long term? And do we want to change uh, or look at changing a little bit the asset allocation strategy? Question. Okay. I know that was a lot in a, in a relatively short <laughs> period of time, but uh, nice questions? job, yeah. Ken. Nice job. Really, uh, really well done. And, uh, you know, just getting back to that GameStop thing, the retail investor is back in the market after 20 years. Tens of millions of these kids were sitting at home. And they got on Robinhood. They started trading stocks because they were working from home. And it and I think the markets are going to go. I think we're going to have some crazy times here in the next two or three years because these millennials are they're very aggressive. 
and and they have nothing stopping them from pushing the button on the phone yeah. to buy stocks. So we're going to see things we haven't seen in the last few years. And uh, whether we make adjustments to our allocations, if this thing bubbles up through 40,000 or not, is a debate we should have down the line. I'm just putting it out there. <clears throat> I know we're long-term oriented, but you know, once again, actuarial tables are based on how well we do our allocation. So just right. just throwing it out there. You know. and, and that's usually a separate meeting in the past. Is that is that correct? A special meeting just to discuss the asset allocation? Yeah. yeah, okay. yeah and all is, that are stuff. people interested in getting a meeting together for that? I'm not I'm not suggesting we do that. All I'm saying is, is that we're gonna see some weird, weird market action here in the next couple of years because the pandemic has created tens of millions of these new online click 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 investors you guys want to pipe in feel free john what i would suggest um you know in terms of having an a, a kind of the traditional asset allocation meeting that that we've done in the past is that we wait until um maybe third quarter so that we can see the impact of the, the, um, the vaccine, what that's done to the economy, what that does to rates, you know, where things sort of settle out and then we'll get a better sense. You know, I, I don't think that that alters uh, what Dennis was saying about the long-term two or three years out, but I think, you know, short-term we'll, we'll at least have a better fix once the pandemic issue may be at least somewhat resolved. Uh, to, to see what, what all that means from a, you know, an allocation standpoint. So maybe we can target the third quarter, you know, for, for having that meeting. And maybe meet in person. <laughs> yeah, that would be how Fingers much cost. Nice. <laughs> Lunch is on me. <laughs> I'm writing that down. You heard him. Are you, I know you are. Show. You're calculating right now, I know. <laughs> yeah, great. That's our May to June. Thank you, Ken. Appreciate okay. it. Thank you. We have uh, Bill. Do you want to? Are you going to share a screen? <laughs> You're muted, Bill. I'll share my screen. Is this Stefan? Yeah. Could Stefan do that? Okay. I should introduce everybody to uh, <laughs> Stefan. He's a he's a uh, he's part of my retirement plan. That's I guess the uh, one way to put this. Um, supposedly I'm reducing my schedule to 30 hours per week this year. <laughs> um, so Jeff bailing me out and, um, he's, he's been doing a lot of work, uh, on the town, both of your benefit statements, review and evaluation, uh, this presentation too. So I'm going to let him do most of the talking and I'll, I'll chime in occasionally. Uh, one of the things that we will want to chat about too is, is reducing the interest rate in the future. Um, because we had a little bit of a dilemma this year. We have the, uh, the, the new mortality tables came out and um, we also have the, the interest rate, which may be a bit high. Um, if you change both in, same year, in the same year, um, I'm going to get accused of wrecking the town's budget. Um, so it's easier to just do one at a time. Um, in this case, I did recommend... Um, changing the mortality table this year and uh, <coughs> primarily because recently I just had an auditor come back and say how come you're not using the Lewis table <laughs> so um, we did make that change and ironically with all the pandemic and everything going along it does have people living longer and it does add liability to the plan but I'll let Stefan take it from here and I'll chime in when necessary okay um, so everybody see the presentation okay Yes. Yeah. All right. So, oh, got out of my mouse a little fast. All right. So, we'll kind of go into some of the basics, really, uh, so you understand, you know, what the purpose of the valuation is. Um, the fundamental underlying point of the valuation is that the town has a cost so that they're going to have to pay due to the benefits that they're promising to their participants. Um, that that there's a basic formula. You're going to pay out the benefits paid, right? Those are what are earned. Um, those are kind of a fixed number. We know what that is. You're going to be, have expenses, whether they're actuarial expenses, attorney expenses, accounting expenses, those types of things. That's also against you. Um, that, those are offset by investment return and the employee contributions. 
ideally we want that investment return to be as large as possible because the bigger this is, the smaller yours is, your cost is. Um, that did not happen this past year. Um, I will say that we're kind of the the bad news bearers here because Ken and Ken and Pat were talking about current market rates. You know where the assets are. The assets are much better. You know they, he gave us a number of about 150 million. When we did, we're doing a snapshot at 7120. The assets were at only about 126 million. So the numbers are going to show show that reflect that. All right. Um, so how do we, we account for those benefits that you're going to pay for? We look at, we measure, we have a cost associated with that. So we, we do it on an entry age normal basis. And that's just one way of allocating the cost. To, so to kind of help the town plan for their, their how they're going to pay for these benefits in the future. Because at the end of the day, you're paying the dollar. For every dollar earned, you're going to pay that out. But that we know that's in the future. So we want to know what that cost is today. So we come up, come up with some method to allocate that cost so the town can help manage its budget going forward. Um, so what we do, we develop a, what we call an actual determined employer contribution, ADEC for short. Um, that, that consists of basically two parts. One of those parts is the annualization of your unfunded accrued liability. And that liability is the, what, what hasn't been funded in the past. And that's kind of, you can think of it as like a mortgage. Um, currently, you're amortizing your unfunded liability over 19 years. The second component is the normal cost. That's the cost that is associated with what the benefits are earned each year, that this current budget year that those participants are going to earn. You know, so that that's counts for their salary times, say, a multiplier of 2%. So your salary is 50,000, 2%. You're going to earn $1,000 of benefit that year. And you multiply that by all your participants. That's basically what your normal cost is for the year. Okay. Pretty good so we, far. I was going to say, I'd like to consider the normal cost as the future service cost. And the um, the amortization paying off the unfunded liability is the past service cost. So those are your two portions of your ADEC. Okay. All right. So these are some of the basic highlights of what has happened. You know, uh, as, as I think it was Ken that mentioned, you know, last time we looked at lowering your interest rate assumptions back in 2018. Um, I don't remember what it was, if it was like seven and three quarters or seven and a half, but you lowered it to seven and a quarter. Um, we really need to start thinking about that again. As Bill mentioned, that we didn't really do that this time. Um, you know, there is some through a thought, or what they said, and what Pat had said, and both Ken had said. You know, over the last 15 years, you averaged about 6.7 percent. Um, you know, your current asset allocation supports maybe around a seven percent. So maybe we got to really think about that hard next year. Uh, it does have a fairly sizable impact in what that does. Um, but what we did do this year is the mortality table. Uh, back in, I believe it was early 2018, the Society of Actuaries released new tables, and these tables were geared specifically for the public sector. Um, previously, the tables encount, you know, incorporated most of the private sector participants, so that was kind of ignoring what actually happens in the public sector. Um, the downside of this was that they determined that people that work in the public sector live a lot longer than people in the private sector, and of those, teachers live the longest. Um, whether that's true, it doesn't always seem that way. You don't think that, but that's a, what the data tells us, right? And everything these days is all about the data. Everybody's looking at data. What does the data say? And so that has a, a big impact. Um, we also, in turn, you know, because of the current market, the inflation has been dropping, and we lowered the inflation, which kind of offsets some of that increase on the mortality side. Um, and with the inflation, we lowered the salary scale. The net impact of those changes was about an increase of liability of $2.8 million. Um, what that, that does flow through to your ADEC, and I say that later, uh, that increased your ADEC by about $263,000. Um, you did have some kind of minor plan changes where you increased overtime for several groups. That had a little impact, you know, because that's kind of a future service cost. That increased your ADEC again by about $66,000. Uh, on top of that, you had some minor liability loss of a little over 100000 and that's really only you know less than one percent of 0.07 percent of liability so that tells us really that the assumptions are doing a fairly good job you know so we're not getting the huge swings and losses from year to year so we're, we're pretty much right on target there on the bad the bad side is that assets did did not perform quite as well and you lost about 1.6 million in, in asset losses and that has a sizable impact on the adec so that increased the adec by $150,000. Um, we do smooth assets 
but even with the smoothing, it's, it's not enough to offset the losses that were sustained this past year. And obviously most of that occurred in that first quarter. Um, you know, if we measure today, be much on the positive side, you have probably, you know, sizable gains. And hopefully they continue. And when we measure the 7121 valve, that'll be reflected at that point in time. Um, because we do smooth assets, we do have a difference in the asset values. You know, the market value is a, is a million dollars smaller than the actual value. So what that really means is once, if, if we earn the same, what we're expected over the next five years, that million dollars is gonna increase your unfunded liability because now the actual value is gonna be smaller. So now you're gonna have another $1 million to amortize. And that will drive your contribution up slightly. Okay. Anything on those main points? Nope. Yeah, I, I got a, uh, this is Mark. I, I have maybe two questions. Yeah. I, I think I understand the first bullet, though I'm confused with the 2018 valuation. We, we basically used the rate of return of 7.25, which the board adopted a couple of years ago, and probably we should be revisiting. But yeah. I, I'm just confused with why we're referencing the 2018 value. I just kind of wanted to point out that was the last time you had looked at that assumption. And, and okay, that, okay. That's, that's really just for an informational point, but just just to kind of bring it to your forefront. Hey, we looked at it two years ago. Yep. It's two years down the road, maybe we should think about it again, just to kind of get that kind of seed, plant the seed, so to speak. Yep. Second? The second, the second bullet. Um, <clears throat> I guess the first question is, it, it says pub 2010. I, when I first read this the other day, I, I'm think, I was thinking, oh, that was the last time we uh, updated our uh, mortality tables and that didn't jive with my regulation. So I no. guess the 2010 has nothing to do with the year. Correct. Well, it has something to do with the year that the information, the, the base table is. So when the study started, right? So 2010 study basically and the base tables, I believe, are from the 2006 base year. And then, and on top of that, so that's a base table. That's when they come up with a preliminary table. Then each year on top of that, there's what we call an improvement scale. Um, and back in 15, and that's called MP, and I think that's the mortality improvement scale is what that stands for. And back in 15, they, they had the initial one. So what that does, they kind of get, gather new data, additional data from what they used initially to make the table and see how that's affecting true actual mortality in the marketplace. And so every year what they do now, they, they decided, decided that they're gonna release a new updated table each year. And, since and, that, and will you just automatically, I mean, to me, it would make sense that if the information yeah. is available every year, we just automatically update it every year. Absolutely. I know that wasn't the case years ago, but is mm -hmm. that gonna be the- Yes. and and. In the past five years, you really wanted to do that because each year's mortality improvement scale dropped the liability slightly. Yeah. This year only being about less than a half a percent, roughly. But again, a little bit, a half a percent on you know two hundred million dollars is, is still a big number. Yeah, um, so I mean, I, I'm just one person. I mean, to me, I'd rather do it every year and have it be. Yep, yeah, we will. Smaller the, increment. The big change really was going from what we call the RP tables. And they came out there at RP 2014, and that's when those tables were initiated. And the 2010 was basically the study was on the 2010, 2010 mortality study on the public sector. Um, so we switched from the RP to the pub tables, which from basically think of a private sector to a more of a municipal sector. Okay, I guess where I'm getting, I, I'm confused is, is I believe there was a comment made that we didn't wanna do both in the same year. And I get, do the, uh, the rate of return adjustment and this, um, the mortality table every at the same time, but I don't. We're not doing it at the same time. If, most, if we're just you know, so most towns I'm don't sorry. do that just because the impact to their budget is fairly dramatic. Um, you know, as, as I mentioned, about a quarter percent drop in the in interest rate will be about a four hundred and fifty thousand dollar increase to your ADEC. Yeah, I I understand. I, so. I understand that, but if we're every year just tweaking the mortality table, then that should not be that big of a, I mean, that's what I don't understand. That's where I'm, I guess I'm confused because on the one hand, I, I had start be, at the beginning of this meeting, I'm thinking, okay, we had to do one or the other because the increase would be too big. I get that. Yep. Having sat in John's seat, uh, I absolutely can <laughs> understand that. Um, but I don't. What I what I don't understand is what we're really doing. Because I, 
Let's, I thought we just, I thought you were just saying the mortality tables get tweaked every year and that's what we're using every year. So there shouldn't it, be a big there's a, no, 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 that's the first year. Right? Go ahead. I think he's saying now on a go forward, they're doing it every right. year. Yeah. It's a big jump the first year and then it'll be a minor tweaks each other year. Well, that is thinking of it this way. There's, there was actually two things that occurred, two kind of tweaks to mortality. One, the big one was changing the base table. That's the big one. The other one that I said happens occurs every year. That small tweak to the improvement scale that's been occurring every year, um, probably since fifteen. So that's already that kind of happens every year automatically, so to speak, because as you said, you want to use the latest table. Um, what really the big impact this year is because we changed the base table that the at the fundamental the, the bottom line the base rates are set at. And so hopefully that's a little clearer for you. Um, that's the real big change. The one table to another table, that's the big change. The improvement is, is kind of what you say is occurring automatically. As you said, that's going to be adopted automatically. So it's really the base table that changed. Was that a little clearer, hopefully? When would the base table, would, do we expect to see a big change in a couple of years in the base table? Or because we're incrementally increasing things, should the base table be? I believe you know, they're going to do a, a new mortality study every five to ten years. So okay. I, I wouldn't expect another table for three or four years at, at, at the earliest, especially with the pandemic that slowed things down a lot. Um, the public sector, because it's just done, that's one of the more recent ones. They're focusing on other other sector mortality tables. So these this will be the table for quite some time. You know, for probably three to five years from now. Yeah, historically, I think one of the first, you know, there was a 1951 mortality table, and then that that wasn't changed for several years. Um, a lot of people went to um, from that table, they went to um, 1971 table, and from that table, a 1983 table, and so these these base mortality studies don't change all the time. They historically they change, you know, in, in maybe. 10 year increments. Mm -hmm. um, so we, the 1983, then there was a 1994 table that was used by several uh, folks. Uh, then 1994 um, pretty much went to the, to the RP2000 table, um, which we did some projections on, et cetera. And now um, this 2010 table. So it doesn't, the base tables don't change that often. Um, and now this, this other thing, this mortality improvement. Um, so we think, you know, we have these base mortality rates and we think technology is going to improve and have people living longer, uh, <clears throat> absent the pandemic, of course. But the, um, you know, those, those rates are tweaked every year and they, they do minor changes. Um, half a percent is pretty, pretty common for the impact of those changes. Um, not like changing the base table, as Stefan mentioned. But has the practice always been to tweak tweak those tables every year, or is this something? What I'm trying to get at is in three or five years, whenever the new table, base table comes out, do we expect a big change, or will these annual incremental adjustments buffer that to some degree? I don't know. They just started with the mortality improvement um, changes every year. They just started that in 2014. There were some mortality improvement projections that we were using before, but kind of a static amount of improvement we were projecting. Now it's been studied every year. And in general, since 2014, since I started doing this, the mortality, the rate of mortality improvement has not been as high, if you will. So we still think it's improving from the base, people living longer than the base table, but not as not as high as what's going on right now. Yeah. So to, to know what's going to happen the next time they do a mortality study, maybe 2000, you know, uh, it'll be a while before they do another one, I'm sure. And this is actually the first one I've, that they've ever done that isolated some of the people do public sector work. So. Okay, thank you. I have a question which may be unrelated, but I know that the town is going to a cash balance plan for future employees. Mm -hmm. So does that have any effect on any of these tables? No, you're still gonna have the same underlying mortality for them. 
Well, um, let me put in a, say a couple comments about the cash balance. Um, the cash balance will pretty much insulate the town from whatever rates of return you get because the people, you know, the, the most I think they can get is a 5% return. Oh, yeah. um, and so to the extent that, that the fund can earn more than 5%, this will be good news for Ken, um, it'll actually save the town, you know, quite a bit of money mm. um, to cover that. And usually the liability for the, uh, for the cash balance plan um, it's generally what, whatever the cash balance is. So not a big thing for mortality with respect to the cash balance plan. The exception being that if somebody takes their cash balance and converts it to an annuity, then they will be a retiree like everybody else. And then they'll be subject to the mortality tables. So in the interim period, pretty much your liability is your cash balance. But if somebody retires and takes the cash balance, well, they, you know, their liability is gone, but I mean, that's one of the options. But if they decide to convert it to an annuity, you'll, you'll still have some funding liability for those folks. John, isn't it true, though, that everybody in the town that's hired from now on has to go on to the cash balance plan, that this old retirement plan is no longer available? No, we're still in the midst of uh, changing. So oh, you it's, are. It's implemented. Okay. Yeah, we're still working on it. Okay. Implemented for the, uh, for the non-union folks? Not yet. Um, yep. We still have to do that ordinance update that Eileen's been working with you on. Okay. Quick question. This is Jason. Um, we had talked last meeting and there was some confusion on whether that money from the cash balance plan would be uh, one big pot of money with the pension or it could be separate. Um, have we uh, re decided like how that's going to go? Is it all going to be in one fund? It's generally it one fund. Okay, you said one fund, John? Yep, yep. All right, thanks. Yeah. As okay. I said, obviously, the, the, the benefit of the cash balance is a little easier to manage the cost going forward. You kind of, it's kind of a fixed cost. You kind of know what that is. You know, it's kind of related to salary and service. So it's, it's easier to, you know, uh, to budget for. Uh, and really, the only the longevity risk is really for those who take the annuity down the road. Yeah, and for the cash balance plan, you know, if we, you know, for the defined benefit plan, if we lower the assumed rate of return from um, seven and a quarter to seven, it's going to increase the town's cost. Um, it will, that that type of change won't impact the cost of the cash balance plan at all. Okay. All right. So going forward, and you know, now we're just going to kind of get into the things that actually occurred or what the, the bulk of the report consists of. Um, this page kind of goes through the gain or loss that, that that's occurred from one year to the next. Um, it measures the change in unfunded liability. You know, last year your unfunded liability was 26 million. We expected it to be about 25.7. It was actually 27.4 million. So you had that 1.7 million loss and that's kind of showed right here in the middle. Um, those losses were really broken up. As you can see, the bulk of that was one point, almost 1.6 million was due to the assets, as I mentioned previously. This is just getting more into the, the weeds here of what I had mentioned on the prior page. Um, the assumption changes 2.8 million, you know, that's increased the liability as well as the unfunded liability, right? That doesn't change. Um, so now you're, you're really unfunded is 30 million. So that kind of, those are some of the components that go into making up why your, your ADEC went up a little bit. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, this page, we got to remember we're taking a snapshot of the assets as of 7 one um, whereas Pat and Ken were talking about, you know, 12-31 or up even up to February. So their assets are a lot bigger, better. Um, uh, this just kind of develop, shows you the kind of how we smooth assets uh, as I said, mentioned, we, we smooth assets for, uh, to become use an actuarial value as opposed to a market value. And that's really to help mitigate or dampen the effect of market swings, whether they're positive or negative. Um, this, this chart in the bottom kind of shows you the lo losses or the gains from the last five years. You see this year was 2 million loss. Um, this is on market value, market basis, you know, minor losses on the 18 and 19 years. 
Um, another a gain back in 16, 17 of 3 million. And you had this big loss that just got wiped out this past year. Um, but here's this, this million 70 in the lower right-hand corner is really the difference between the actual value and the market value and uh, up here that you can see up on the top. And as I mentioned, if once as you smooth this, if we get the same earnings, your unfunded is going to increase by a million because the, right now the actual value is a million dollars higher than the market value. So that just increases your unfunded, which will drive up your contribution slightly. Okay. Um, this, just, this, this next chart just really shows you kind of the historical rates of return. Um, the purple is a market value basis. You can see it goes up and down, certainly back in 15, 16, 17. The last couple of years, it's, it's been much closer to seven, eight, six, seven percent. Um, you know, whereas on the, the actual values, this orange line, you can see that's you can see the effect of the damping, the smoothing of it. It's really only gone from six to nine percent. Um, more recently, the six to seven percent. You know, um, so it just kind of gives you a feel for why we're doing that or what it, how it helps. This next chart is just kind of a graphical representation to show you the liability, which is the, the purple bar and versus the actual value of assets. So that, that, that difference is really the unfunded liability. It's, it's, it's growing a little bit this year, mostly due to the assets in that big assumption change. But overall, it seems like it's been fairly consistent. You know, 14, 15, 16, 17, you had roughly the same magnitude of the unfunded liability that you're, you're still recognizing. Um, last couple of years, more, more or less, is due more to the performance of assets over time. Hopefully this will shrink next year. I'd expect this, this to be much smaller, this, this, this uh, jump here, because the assets have been performing quite well. Okay. This is just, here just shows you kind of the funded ratio. Um, back in 14, when things were great, you're you know 90% or 85% funded. Um, now you're more closer to 80%, which is not bad. The bulk of the municipalities in Connecticut are between the 80 and 90% funded ratio. That's probably about 50% of them are funded in this this range. So you are you know in the majority, um, which is not a bad thing. I think they're actually higher um, than the majority. I think the average funded percentage. The chart in the back that shows that, so we'll get to that. Yeah, okay, good. Um, this is just the de development from, for your ADEC from this year, as well as last year, kind of, so you can kind of see, as you can tell, the first line shows you the normal cost. Normal cost really didn't change too much. Um, employee contributions went down a little bit. So your normal cost has gone up a little bit due to the change in employee, estimated employee contributions. Um, the biggest change really has to do with your unfunded liability that went up over $400,000. Again, that's due to the assets underperforming as well as the change due to mortality. Um, so your, your contribution went from just about under 4.3 to just about 4.8 million, about 575,000 or so. Um, okay. And I guess I'd point out that, you know, you can expect it to be in this 4.8, 4.9 range for the next couple of years, unless we have some sizable gains in the market side of things. Um, Obviously, you haven't done the cash balance. Once that happens, it'll, it tends to be a year or two, a couple of years to start to see that savings um, for this to go down because you still have people accruing in the DB plan as well as the, the DC, the, the now the cash balance type plan. Um, so that's why I would expect the, the contribution to be roughly the same. If the gains that we've accumulated since this valuation was done, continue through the end of the fiscal year, mm -hmm. would, would that significantly impact on that number at all? Yeah, it's, it's definitely will because it's gonna lower you unfunded. So say gains are 20 million, you're gonna recognize four, you know, you're still gonna have some of those gains spread in the future. So you're not gonna recognize it, say a whole 20 million of gains. You're gonna right. recognize a fifth of that. So say it changes your unfunded liability by 4 million. So it's gonna knock down 4 million amortized over 19, 18, 19 years type of thing. Okay. So a couple hundred thousand will drop it probably. Okay. Similar to how we saw 1.6 million loss increased it by 160,000. On the flip side, it would it decrease at 160,000 or you know 200,000. And again, you'll, you'd see that for several years, assuming you know we, we maintain that. And, and I guess one point thing to point out to kind of reaffirm what you had stated um, on the interest rates. You know, it's the Fed 
indicator really they're not going to move rates for the next couple of years you know so we kind of think things are going to be that that low interest rate system that, that, that we've been seeing the last couple of years to, to keep going forward um, the next couple of slides are just in detail we don't have to go into unless you want to look at a specific union um, this is all in the report this kind of just shows based on the different groups that you have you have us report on um, you know it looks like the biggest ones are town the town non-union group that, that has the biggest chunk um, oh, police union, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. A camera's in the way there. <laughs> so, yeah, the 1.5, so I guess, the, which is not surprising. Police tend to have the big, biggest benefits, police and fire. Um, here shows the Board of Ed, Board of Ed. You know, you got the anomaly of the Board of Ed custodians having their assets being greater than their liability. Um, that must have occurred several years ago because it's been flowing through and it's kind of how we split the assets and everything. Um, so, they're, they're actually kind of a credit. For, the, for their group. Um, next biggest group looks like the fire, which is not surprising. Any questions on the, the splits here? It's more for I'm assuming internal purposes and how you allocate costs. Um, contribution trends. I guess this one's not a great graph because you know it's gone from just under three million to just under five million over the last you know six years or so. Um, uh, I guess it, you know, it's not unexpected as people continue to accrue benefits. Um, ideal, you know, the normal costs hasn't grown terribly. It's really that red portion, the unfunded liability, that's kind of grown, and that's that has more of an impact on how the assets perform over the last few years, and why that's kind of moving that way. But we, it's also grown because, like, when we changed the lowered the yeah. discount assumption from seven and a half percent to seven and a quarter percent. Yes, yeah, that, it changes the mortality, so that increases the unfunded as, as well. So yeah, so the, the nineteen to twenty jump is most likely why you see that. That's the due to the, the discount rate drop, and this year the twenty one to twenty two is partially due to the assets as well as the mortality change. So that's where you kind of yeah, see I think big step. yeah, we looked at it about sixty percent of the increase was was going to happen anyway with the plan changes and the assets, um, and and the other forty percent of the increase from this year was due to the mortality table. Okay. Um, here's the executive summary. This is kind of a one page snapshot that kind of shows details a lot of the, what's in the report. Um, it compares last year to this year. You know, your head counts roughly the same. So there's no real change in the population of the plan. It was odd too. I have a question on this page when there's a chance. This page, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Under uh, where it says vested in employee contributions only one, well, right now, when, as soon as you hit five years, you're vested fully in the plan. So what's that? Is that a hold up from when things were different before? What's that? I believe for? so, because the only one, most likely, it's, it probably should be someone that gets dumped in. We probably we want to show them in this bucket with a 30. So that would just be a deferred vested going forward. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's it. When we were at 10 years, probably. Probably. Oh, we team, somebody yeah, that was yeah. <laughs> that person's not going to be too hard to identify, you know. Right. Uh, okay. Thank you. Yep. Payroll, roughly the same. Um, the average average salary, modest. So you probably had some savings here on the salary. So like, and I, I wouldn't be surprised because we've seen a lot of towns where they, they kind of had like a pay freeze due to the pandemic. Um, it could be furloughs or whatever. There's a lot of things right there. Mm -hmm. um, present value, of future benefits. This is kind of growing, going up a fair amount. Part of that could be due to the, the change in overtime and the plan changes that's going forward. That, that's going to be recognized going forward. Um, Liability has gone up as well. A big chunk of that. Uh, and expected to grow a little bit. And some of that is also due to the mortality table. Um, assets went from 123 to 126, 127. Modest gain. We obviously wanted to see them grow a lot more than that, at least the 77% or so. Uh, so your funding ratio dropped a little bit. That's probably mostly due to that change in mortality uh, in the eight X at the bottom. This this page right here. Um, I don't know if you've probably you've seen it before. Uh, hopefully we we do provide the report to you. Um, it's kind of shit what we do. We 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 look at all the cappers in the state of Connecticut once they are produced. We kind of look at some data, you know, various metrics to measure at. Um, so here we look at what, what everybody's using for the long-term rate of return. Um, 
you are in that seven, seven and a quarter, you know, seven and a quarter to seven and a half range. So uh, it's, it's still, you're up, you're up a little high. As you can see, a lot of people are at the 7%, you know, either six and a half, six and three quarters to seven and a half, seven percent roughly is where the bulk of it is. This tells us the average rate is 6.74. Um, and it really depends on what your asset allocation is and, and the assumptions utilized where we expect you to be. Um, as, as I think it was Ken that stated that, you know, probably more like the 7% range. Um, you know, I would think between six and seven, five to 7% is probably where you, you guys should be based on your historical returns and where we're expecting to go in the future. Um, but again, I think that's something we'll, we'll, we should look at when we do the 21 valuation. Um, so this is, you know, the trend has been continuing down, down from the prior year. Um, I expect it to continue when we look at the 20 cappers. And this next one is, is to show the, the funded ratio. So I said, you guys are in the bulk of it. You know, actually higher, you know, 23% is in the 80, 90, you know, between 70 and 90% is where 50% of the towns are. Um, so in Europe, so you're ahead, you know, there's only 20% higher than you guys, roughly. So you're up upper top 40% tile. Okay, I think we just have one more slide. Um, okay, so... What do we say the current rate of return is seven and a quarter. Um, expect the loss to be reduced by 175,000, so that could, that can flow into your your contribution. But we know I don't like to state anything there because we do know assets have gone up quite a bit. Um, you know, once, hopefully they continue to rise until 6:30, and we'll see what that does. Um, like I said, the contribution we expect won't be any shouldn't be any lower unless we get some great returns on the assets, and that I think. That might be a good time for you to look at the interest rate because if you get some gains on the asset side, you can obviously offset some of the increase in aid, the ADEC due to the drop in your interest interest rate. Let's say at twenty five percent, it would be four fifty, so we can kind of estimate. Right? Um, the I do want to go to the bed side. That's going to continue just for the way the assets are split. Um, they got some plans, and they they got a smaller group as well. Um, so I, don't, I think the, the key one right here is that last bullet where I mentioned that a 25%, 25 basis point drop will increase your ADEC by about 450,000. Um, that's regardless of what the assets does. So hopefully the gain on the assets will dampen that, make, make it smaller. Maybe it's only 200,000, but something that what you can kind of think about. Right. So to the group, I would like to add this to the discussion on this to the May schedule agenda if everyone's okay with that ideally personally i'd like to see us get the seven percent within two years maybe do an intermediate step but that's just my own personal view yeah and we I have to say that. that we do have a lot of plans that um you know they go down 10 basis points a year or 12 and a half basis points a year so that would give you two steps 12 and a half basis points would get you down to seven in two years so there's nothing magical about doing you know 25 basis points in one year it's you know we can work with your asset folks and your board to figure out what's best for you guys. Okay. Yep. Any other questions? Yep. Yep. Thank you very much. Good presentation. Right. Good, good information. John, this is Mark and, and maybe Cindy. Um, I just don't recall. Do we need to, should we be accepting the valuation report? Um, I, th I think we did. Let's do it um, just in case. Yeah. So moved. Okay. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Seven Everyone and Bill, thank you both very much. Yeah. Stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy. So we'll it. add that to the uh, May agenda then. And if there's uh, no other business, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay. I'll second, Jason. Got it. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank Good you. Good the next well, three months. Thank you. <laughs> Stay healthy. Thank you, everybody. Stay well, everybody. Stay yeah. safe. Thanks. Yes. Yeah, See you in May.
Let's see you then.